everywhere we go, people want to know who we are and where we come from. So who are you and where'd you come from? I'm Mary Bourne, like from Bali Bali Ali or <laughs> Bali Fairman. <laughs> Mary, you and I, I don't know how we were introduced, but we go back a while now. We do, yes, yeah. yeah. And I was very lucky you joined me on the stage in the Helix um, for the live show. And we only had like a 10 minute conversation. <laughs> that like was just unreal. The audience reaction to you was insane. Yeah. I have to say, I, I, I got that much more in than I thought it would get in in 10, in 10 minutes. And I told them very personal things. Mm. But... You know, I think that's what endured. You know, they were looking at me and they were saying, she's just like me. Mm. And when I was telling them all the things, I was making fun of it. Mm. They were laughing with me, not, mm. at, not at me. They were mm. laughing with me. And I just, I enjoyed every minute of that. Oh. Now, I will say I had a few glasses of wine beforehand. But, you know, we'll say nothing about that. <laughs> and Rob Morphy said, don't be drinking. Yes, I'm all right. But it was great. I enjoyed it. I really like, did. Like, the thing I remember from it the most was, like, someone shouting, Mary, you rock it. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, that is just the best thing ever. Every one of them. I mean, I, f- I heard, Mary, I love you. Mary, you're brill. You know, you're great, Mary. And that just, that because I suffer with um, insecurities, mm. you know. Like, we all do. We all mm. have insecurities. So to hear people saying that, it just, it gives you a build. Mm. And especially when they're your own type of people. Mm-hmm. When they're ordinary people mm. who look at you and see themselves in you. I think that's brilliant. Yeah, it, really and is. it was. It was great. And the thing was, after it, like, everyone was like, so I put the video out and then everyone was like, is there, is, is there another podcast? Is Mary doing another show? Is Mary, <laughs> then, can you get Mary on the pod? Is Mary going on the pod? And then I did, like, a question box. And you were in that as well. I was like, lads, I'm just trying to pin her down. And yeah. when I pin her down. <laughs> we'll be there. I was like, we'll be there. So do you want to tell me a little bit about your life? Because we know about you, like, we know where you came from with Tesco's and the X Factor. So tell me, like, how did that all even come about? Well, I mean, for years, I mean, I was born and reared in Ballyferma. Mm. I was born at 26 Kymore Drive. So it was obvious I was going to end up working in Ballyferma. And Tesco's just happened. I mean, I worked over in Centra for five years and then... Oh, I just got to pain me backside with that. So I decided mm. to go for Tesco. It was a bigger job, better thing. So I went in, I started working in Tesco's. And I was 11 years in Tesco's when my brother happened to turn around and say to me, would you not start learning some backing tracks and come out singing with me? Because he used to do Tom Jones. Right. So I said, I don't know, Tom, I'm still very nervous because I stopped singing for a long time. And Why did you stop singing? I had Deborah and uh, I suppose things that were said to me by certain pe- person uh, who I who will rename ma- nameless, um, he kind of made me feel that I was worthless and that I couldn't sing, that I was just, people were just being kind to me. And that I actually started to believe that, that, you know, why does anyone want to listen to me if, it, you know, if he's saying this and she's saying that? So, but I sat on the till and this is on my mother and father who are in heaven. And I turned around and it was a beautiful sunny day out. And I had gone back singing with Tomo and I started to go over to the Shamrock in Finglas. Mm. And I started getting standing ovations. Now, I used to have a few beers before I got up, so I, I don't even think I was singing well. Because <laughs> you know yourself, when you're drinking, you, you can't even hear the music. Mm. But for some strange unknown reason, when I did the Shirley Bassey number or a big song, they were just standing and standing up and clapping me. So I sat on the till and I said to God, or whoever is in the universe, I know there's something bigger for me. So what I'm going to say to you now, universe or God, I remember the words I said, If you open the doors, I promise you, I will walk through them and I will work my butt off. And that was, I would say, about four years before The X Factor. And then all of a sudden, my brother rang me and he said, Mary, there's an audition going on, he says, for um, Nullick Number One. And I said, what's Nullick Number One? He said, T.G. Carr. And I said, Tom, will there be all kids at that? Mm. And he said, no, there won't. No, I guarantee. He said, look, we'll go down for the crack. And we were dying with a hangover. We'd been gigging the night before. And it was on a Sunday afternoon down along the docks mm. and into the big hotel. I can't remember the hotel that's down there in the docks, which I hadn't down to the point. But anyway, in we went and we were, I was right. There was gangs of kids everywhere. But we did our audition. Both of us got through. He got knocked out in the first round and I went on to win it. Stop. Now, in saying it, the song I sang was You'll Never Walk Alone, but in Irish it was called Shulat. Right. It downloaded 19 copies. But... That's okay. It was that thing of standing on the stage. I never looked at the cameras. I didn't look at the judges. I didn't care. That kind of I said to myself, well, if I can do this, I can do anything. But mm. anyway, that was over. My niece said to me, you have to go on the X Factor. And I, I remember Simon Cowell saying, 
you know, he would never come back to Ireland because there was no talent there. Mm-hmm. So I used this excuse, thinking I was going to, and I said, look, if Simon comes back to Dublin, I'll go for it. Two years later, Simon came back to Dublin. So that's how that bit started. I mean, he's pushed and pushed and pushed until I went for the, the auditions. And how do you tell Tesco you're, go, you're going in to do this? Well, you know, I didn't say that to them mm. in, in the beginning. I went in, I queued up in Crow Park, two o'clock in the morning with my daughter. God love her. She bought me a camp chair. She, because I have arthritis, both knees. <laughs> and she bought a, a flask, put tea in it, sandwiches. But when we got in there, the place was packed. And the atmosphere, it was absolutely electric. Everybody was singing. There was a few people drinking. Mm. I was just drinking my coffee and my tea with my daughter. Mm. At six o'clock that morning, um, the guys came out with the cameras. And your man said to me, and who are you with? And I looked, no, I, I got where he was coming from. I was an older woman. The rest were all young kids. And I said, I'm here to audition. And he just moved the camera away from me. What? And I remember turning around and saying to him, watch this space, boy. And he walked, and I became friends with him. Oh, my God. Because he couldn't believe when he heard me singing in Crow Park, a cappella, and all the crowd started clapping. They couldn't hear anybody else singing. My big mouth just opened up. I, I, you have nothing. And the place went into an eruption. It was unbelievable. And I became friends with that guy, the camera fella, and he was one of the producers of the show. So, <clears throat> where was I going? We trend the talk there. No, but hang on. Even that, like, I'm getting me back. Like, it's like, whoo. Like. Well, so, uh, even me, when I think about it, goose, I get the, yeah. the goosebumps. Mm. Just thinking about, you know, me standing on the pitch in Crow Park and singing a cappella. And this guy said absolutely nothing to me. When the crowd clapped, he handed me this card, a yellow card, I think it was, and told me to go upstairs. And I said, anything else? He said, no. Off you go. Go up. So off I went and upstairs and your woman told me to come back at seven o'clock the next morning. So I had three more auditions the next day, all in front of producers. And every one of them just let me sing. I only sang two lines of I Who Have Nothing to the first one at seven. And he said, you're down there, just to go down the hall there. Sang that. And then the last one is, you're being filmed. I didn't know I was being filmed. So I start singing. And your man, I couldn't see your man. He was behind this yoke. I knew there was lights on, but mm. I, didn't know, I couldn't see the camera. So I sang away and he said, do you know any... Um, no, up to date songs. And of course, I'm, I like the old songs. Mm. But there was one song because Andr- and Alexandra Bork had won the X Factor the year before. So I loved Alleluia. Mm. But I was only learning it. So I started singing it. And I'm getting to the part where I don't know. And, I, and here I am. That's it now. I said, that, that's all. I've, I've only learned that. And he goes, OK. And I said, thanks. And I went to run. He caught me back. I said, hang on, Mary. Hang on. Now, I still couldn't see him in the dark. Mm. He said, we'll be in touch with you, you know, if you've made it through. And I said, yeah, kind of got it that. And out the door I went and home and heard nothing. And then, no, he, the girl outside said, you'll hear her in the month. If you don't hear her in the month, you're not true. Yeah. A month passed. And I'm, this is how I got back to tell Tesco. Came back to Tesco, went to my boss and I said, look, I want to go on in for the, the X Factor. And he was pissing himself laughing because he knew I had done the Nullick number one. Mm. And they, were, they looked after me for that as well. Mm. Like they, anything I wanted, any times I wanted off. And they paid me. Yeah. That was back in Nullick number one. And they weren't getting, you know, the, yeah. what they got from the X Factor. But I went down and he said to me, you're joking me. I said, no. So then it started to pitter down to the, to the customers. And I got to a stage that I couldn't even sit on the till because the tills were becoming, the, the crowds were getting bigger and bigger. Just coming up to see what was happening. And he wore you up, man. So there was no work being done. <laughs> so the boss called me in and he said, look, I'm going to let you off for, for a month until you hear that. He said, and we'll pay you. He says, because this is ridiculous. We can't, we can't, we can't do this. You know, because everyone's going, hello, Mary. I, I have nothing. And they, like, as I told him, that's the song I was going to yeah. do. So I was off for one month. <clears throat> and on the Friday of the fifth week after the, sh- after the auditions, mm. I was getting up because I said, I'll go back to work. There's no point. I'm going. So I was going around to tell them I'd back on Monday and blah, blah, blah. Hadn't heard that and it wasn't true. And the phone rang. And it was an English accent. And her name was Helen. I'll remember to this. To the day I die, I'll remember it. And she said, hello, Mary. And I said, hello. And I said, who's this? And she says, hi, my name is Helen. I'm from the X Factor. And I fell off the bed. <laughs> and my coxes hit the ground. And the screams me on the ground. She says, are you all right? You all right? I said, I just slipped off the bed. I said, no, you <laughs> <laughs> But she turned around and says to me, um, do you have any uh, physical problems? I said, yeah, I have arthritis. And I said, I suffer with depression. I said, I'm a little bit mad like all of us. And she said, that's no problem. That's no problem. She said, I just want to tell you that you've made it true to the judges. And I just sat there on the floor 
Spoke to her for a few minutes. Can't remember what I said to her. Can't remember what she said to me. Said on the floor. My daughter came running up and said, what's wrong, ma? I said, I'm true to the judges. And they're coming here. And she went, oh, I thought it was about to win in the lotto or something. And then she went off downstairs. <laughs> and I'm still sitting there shocked. So that's how all of that mm. came about. So then I went back to Tesco's. And I had to tell them that I was true to the judges. And mm. he said, you cannot walk near Mary. He said, the, the crowds would be too much. Yeah. And he was right because I came, I said, oh, look, I want to come back to work. I don't want to be sitting around. I'm not going to see them until the end of April. Yeah. So I came in for two days and I couldn't tell anybody I was true to the judges. So they, they were still asking the questions. The crowds were still coming in. And they, there were a lot of older people because I wouldn't have told the younger yeah, ones. Yeah. So all my older um, customers were coming to me. And these were people who came to me long before I went on Nullock or RM. Um, mm. The X Factor, and they used to bring me in bars of chocolate, uh, uh. and they'd, I'd sing old songs with them. Paul, just do that dishwasher. Sorry. I would sing old songs with them, and I would uh, talk to them about their. Some of them would go out and come back in two or three times uh. because they were lonely. So they'd come in and they would talk about the dog they had at home, or the pain in their back, or you know they felt a bit lonely. Their daughter wasn't coming up this weekend, and they did that all the time. I think that's how I got on with them so much because. I could relate to them mm. and I had time for them. Now, a lot of the, the girls that worked in Tesco's had lots of time for the, mm. the customers as well. But I just had a bond with the older people. I don't know why. Maybe it's because I miss my mum and dad. Mm. Having a clue. Mm. But I just know that when, I, when I'd see them coming in, my heart lifted. And the, I mean, rosary beads. I'd have more prayers put onto the <laughs> till 40 <laughs> than anything else. I'd go out from your break and I'd come back in and there'd be a set of rosary beads sitting there and a, bar, mm. a Mars bar and there'd be... A voucher for something, and it was just they were just so lovely to me. Mm. So, oh, sorry. So, that's I mean, I had to leave Tesco's. I came back, as I said, for two days, and they had to say, tell me to go home because I couldn't get any work done. We t- I mean, the queues like I was on till 40, was one of the small tills, mm. and there was about six tills behind me. But sure, nobody could get to the tills <laughs> behind me because it was down the line, mm. right down the aisle. And they were all waving up at me and, and I was going, oh God. So I ended up going home and nobody, nobody kind of knew. Mm. And then we went in front of the judges and still. Where was that? To remind us. It was in, now I can never remember the name, but you know that mm. big building has the glass goes, that the cons, con, convention con, centre. Convention yeah. centre. That's where that was. And that was from half ten in the morning. And when you see me on the audition, that's half past one in the morning. <gasps> that's how long the process is. Because they have to see loads of people and they do loads of film and and I kind of didn't know what was going on. I was saying, why are they filming me all the fucking time? They kept coming over and asking me questions and stuff like that. And then I got to meet Dermot. Dermot O'Leary. Oh, really? oh my God, what a bum he has. <laughs> it's rock. <laughs> and the kindness of him. Mm. And he's gentle and off. Oh, just look, the X Factor for me had its ups and downs, but it had more ups than it had downs. Mm. And, I, and I'm glad I did it. I really am glad I did it to this day. I'll never, ever regret what I did. I don't care what people say. I often hear people say, oh, you know them, re- and they'd say it deliberately in front of me, mm. them reality shows and the stars that come off them, overnight success. I said, come here, I tell you, I was singing all my life. I sang in every pub club and got dressed in toilets and beckon. So I said, don't give me an overnight success. I said, I, had, I got a great opportunity and I took it and you'll not make me feel bad about doing it because the music industry has changed now. Years ago, the bands all fought their way up. Mm. That doesn't happen anymore because it's, it's all, it's all, um, uh, uh, I'm trying to get the word that it's done. It's like they're all, it's like Westlife, the, no, I love Westlife, mm. but they were all put together like in a package. Yeah. Where years ago, the bands went out and they met each other and they got together and they mm. were working. So it was a different industry then. This is a different time and a different industry. And even now, since the X Factor has gone off the air, gone off the air, gone mm. off the air, um, that's that's even you know the, the, at, when the X Factor was on the industry that industry was being saturated by the mm. amount of people that's on it and I don't think you're ever going to see anybody like Tom Jones Shirley Bassey Neil Young all those old singers they had long stamina because the industry was different then mm. today the stars coming up they're up they have to make their money they have to make sure they have something to fall back on because not many of them and I and I mean this I think out of all the singers that are out there Maybe 10 out of 200 singers mm. will have some sort of stamina. The industry has changed. So anyone ever turns around and says, oh, I wouldn't go on any of those, uh, those shows, what else do you do? Mm. What else do you do if you want to sing? You need a platform. Mm. And the X Factor was the platform. So that's for me. What's your biggest memory of it? 
Oh, Jesus, so many. I mean, the, the one memory that sticks in my head every time was Michael Bublé. When I'm walking down the corridor in Fountain Studios and Louis Walsh called me, and I didn't even know who the man was standing at the door. And he said, have you met Michael? And I went over and I said, how are you? And I went silent. And I put my hand on his face. And I said, are you real? And he started laughing. And I said, what are you laughing at? And he, I said, you're porcelain. And he said, oh, for God's sake, Mary. He said, I've been watching you. Fair play to you. But there was a camera on us at the time. I didn't know what the camera was. So then we went into Michael Bublé's uh, dressing room. He sat in Louis and we had a champagne. And he just yapped to me and he told me, that's when he told me about uh, how to do an album, a, a Bublé album. He said, mm. Bublé your music. You know, he was, just, he was just a lovely guy and he was funny and he was down to earth. So that was one of the memories. The other memory was when I knocked um, Christina Aguilera into a fire extinguisher. I didn't know who she was. <laughs> what? Right. So it's the finals. And I don't know who Christina was singing with. Or maybe it, was, maybe it wasn't the finals. She was there and she was doing a sh- uh, song. And I came out of the room that we used to sit in. And this girl was coming towards me. And I didn't see her. I, but I did. But there was somebody else coming behind me. So I kind of pushed. And she smacked her arm off the table. I said, God, I'm terrible. Sorry, love. She said, in an American accent. She said, oh, it's okay. And off she went. And Niall Horan said to me, do you know who that is? And I said, no, why? I said, who was she? I said, she's not with Simon Cowell. I said, maybe that's Christina Aguilera. <gasps> I said, you are joking me. And there she's going, rooping her arm off oh. me. I, mean, I didn't know who she was. Oh, my God. And it's like the time. Now, Usher, I had heard of Usher because of my daughter. Yeah. So I'm sitting, after doing my gig, mm-hmm. Usher, get this, this fella's up singing, and we're all back in back, because I wasn't watching him. And I'm talking to Rebecca Ferguson. Mm-hmm. And we're having a laugh. And next of all, the chap was there. I said, how are you, Mary? Said, Big black man. How are you, Mary? And I said, how are you? And I said to Rebecca, who's that? And she said, that's Usher. I said, oh, how are you, Usher? I hadn't a clue who he was. <laughs> but that's the truth, and that's how naive I was to mm. all the big pop stars. Yeah. And as I said before, I went on The X Factor as a 50-year-old woman. I didn't go on to be a, a pop star. Yeah. What I wanted was a platform. And most of all, what I wanted was Simon Cowell and Louis to say, God, you can sing. If they had not put me through, how I went through, I will never know. I made more mistakes in judges' houses. I made mistakes in uh, boot camp. And still, they put me through. I do not know how or why. But when I said it to, to, excuse me, Danny Minogue, Danny Mm. says, I'm dropping names here like there's no tomorrow. The floor is full of people. (laughs) (laughs) Just for you on the radio. (laughs) There's lots of stars on the floor. (laughs) But... uh, she said to me, the reason they put you through is because they seen the X Factor. Even though you, you forgot your words in the songs. Mm. She said, but you kept singing. And you made up your own words. Mm. She said, you didn't stop. You just kept going. And she said, they seen something in you that you've never seen in yourself. And that touched me. Mm. That touched me. That made me realise, well, maybe I have got something. Maybe, you know, I can do this as a, for a living. Mm. And the platform was there. And the rest is history. Was all that that you were getting... And all the, I'm being told, like, and I showed you the thing that someone put up today mm-hmm. about you up from the ship that chills. And you know, I'm your biggest fan. The guys, Rob, my dad, everyone, be your biggest fan. Like, so when you're hearing that, is that validation from you to say to him, fuck you? You know, fuck you. Yes. Yes. It would have been in the beginning. Yeah. Now I don't even think God about it. I. I don't care. Mm. And my confidence has grown with my with my performances and stuff like that, I still get very nervous before I go on stage. But uh, just letting you know, there's another name being dropped here. <laughs> Thomas Jones, you mm, know, the mm, man himself. Mm. I asked him when I met him about nerves. I said, you still get nervous. Hang and on, was, tell the story. <laughs> of when I met him? Yeah. All right, well, obviously, you know, I, that was his song. It was his version of the song because mm. Shirley Bassey sung that song first, but he had the hit with it. So we went to while on the X Factor. They used to bring you all these all these things like you know premieres of films and stuff. So they brought us to the Pride of Britain, where I met uh, obviously Westlife, and then I met um, Paul O'Grady and the great Barbara Windsor, who you know played Peggy mm-hmm. on the on EastEnders. I had a cigarette with both of them outside. So I mean, just it's crazy when I think about. It. And when I'm saying it to you, it's like as if you know this is normal. Mm-hmm. It's a normal life. But anyway. The biggest story of the night was someone had said Tom Jones was in the building. Mm. And I'm a huge Tom Jones fan. Always was and always will be. So I'm looking around all the place and I spot him sitting down. And I was about to go over and I don't know which one of the, the kids said, no, wait, because he's giving out a, 
the prize. He's going to be leaving to go up. So I sat there. No, I was talking to, I was talking to Shane of Westlife. Mm. And Louis was there as well. And I'm yapping away and they're saying, you have to do this song, you have to do that song, blah, blah, blah. And I spot Tom Jones from the corner of my eye with his son walking up the corridor. And I said, see you later, lads. And I ran over, kicked my shoes off at the table, running after him. And I'm going, Mr. Jones, Mr. Jones. <laughs> and I heard Mark, his son, saying, Dad, keep walking. And but this, then he turned around and he copped who I was. I said, oh, hang on, Dad. It's the girl that sang your song on The X Factor. And my heart started pumping when I heard this because they knew me. Oh my God. So Tom Jones turns right around and he goes, Well, in his Welsh accent, I can never say he's Welsh accent. Yeah. Hi, Mary. And I went, oh, Mr. Jones, thank you very much for all the music you've given us. And I really, really love you. And, 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 and I'm glad that your song came out. I'm glad I did, did I do okay. And he went, I just want to say this in his Welsh accent. Now, girls yeah. and boys out there, listen, you have to listen to his accent in your own minds. Ireland may have got itself. A female Tom Jones on every part of me body went <laughs> and then he bent down and kissed me nose <laughs> and so the joke on the, on the stage is my nose is full of blackheads because I have never washed it since <laughs> but that's and then I just yeah. got to talk to him and I asked him about his nerves and I asked him about this and he said when you've stopped being nervous Mary he said give it up he said because that's when I'll stop and he's 82 wow so so that was my I, you know, they say don't meet your, your heroes, but that man just, he was just what I thought he would be. Kind, gentle, beautiful, and, oh God, he's sexy. A lot I, of people yeah. wouldn't think so now because he's 82, but I think he's sexy. I think we had that conversation and we were saying, yeah, and so I think half the room was 50, yeah, he's sexy, and half the room were like, he's 82. Yeah, he's 82. Shut up. It doesn't make any difference. It's his voice. It's, it's his voice and it's the way he carries himself and... I mean, you watch him on The Voice mm. and that song he sang there last week or the week before, mm. I'm not sure when it was on, and then told the story about his wife, Linda. I was sobbing my heart out, but I wasn't sobbing my heart out because, I was sobbing my heart because he was talking about his wife, Linda, but his voice at 82 is still golden. Mm. And I could have even a pinch of that when I'm 65 or 70, mm. I would be happy. I would be a very happy girl. And I do have a very deep voice. Mm. And of course, I grew up singing Tom Jones songs and Shirley Bassey songs, so the voice has deepened over the years. And maybe, yes, maybe Ireland does have a <laughs> female Tom Jones, you know? <laughs> and Mary, you sang for the Queen. Oh, we God. have to talk about <clears throat> with our past, and you sang for the Queen. I did. I, I have to say, and I, it was my first time to meet Gay Bourne as well. And okay. Gay was always a... I grew up with Gay as a kid. Mm. I used to remember, you'd be on the 10 o'clock in the, in the morning, or 9 o'clock in the morning till 10, and then I watched them on the Late Late Show. I wouldn't have had a clue what was going on in the Late Late mm. Show, but I just loved the man. I don't know what it was about him. A lot of people, as I got older, said he was an arrogant person, he was this, that and the other. But the man I met mm. wasn't arrogant. The man I met had nothing but respect for me. And that just made me even more, you know, happier to know him. Mm. So he was there. And I remember that day actually very well because we were getting our makeup done myself and gay, you know, <laughs> Lord of mercy on him, up in the thing. And we could see the snipers on the roof. And that, you know, it, it's like... You're standing there and you're, it's surreal. And you know that this little woman is coming, trying to make peace mm. and tell people that, you know, I'm, I'm particularly sorry mm. for what we all did, what we did. Mm. So anyway, make a long story short, went out, sang, and they come up on the, on the stage. And as she's walking up along and I'm looking down her, and this is true to God, my mother and her were born the same year. My mother was born in February, she was born in April. And I'm looking at her, my mother wore, me, wore her hair like that. And my mom died at 69. Not a very healthy woman, God love her. But if she had been alive, she would have looked as a photograph I have at home. My mom was 17, hair the exact same. She didn't look unlike her. Mm. So she just reminded me of my mother. Mm. Now, I got into trouble for saying this. I, was, mm. I, I said this on, you know, loads of interviews when she died. And people said, well, just be grateful. Our son is not your, doesn't remind you of your uncle. I just think people, you know, are begrudgers. And they've, they've mm. they ha we all look, we know we all had trouble. Mm -hmm. And we know that it was down to the English and stuff like that. But we're in a different era now and we're trying to move on and get peace. You you know, you can remember your past. You don't have to live in it. Mm -hmm. That's that's what I feel. But anyway, she walked up to me. This little woman. And I was told she'll only grip the top of your fingers. Well, she didn't with me. She took my hand fully. Now, I'm not a royalist by no mean. Mm -hmm. I am a Republican and I believe in Ireland and the whole lot. Mm -hmm. But I felt very honoured to be standing there in history with this little lady who took my hand and gripped it and then asked me, 
has my life changed since the X Factor? And I said, how does she fucking know? Unless, obviously, the, the president had mm. told her she was, oh, look, I'd say she was well warned and well told. Mm. But she stood talking to me. She said, no. I said, do you ever get to watch it, ma'am? And I wasn't sure what we were to call her, ma'am. Someone said she doesn't like being called ma'am. But listen, she's not my queen, so yeah. I was being as polite as I could possibly be. Mm. So I said, do you get to watch it? No, I don't, she said. It's too late for me. But she said, sometimes, and she said it in the, li- the little voice that she has, mm. sometimes the boys may record it. And I, I do get to see a bit. I remember seeing yourself on it. Mm-hmm. And she mentioned Wagner. Okay. So she, like, he obviously stood out to everyone. Mm. And she just laughed. The, the man with the beard. And I said, oh, Wagner. Yes, yes, that's him, that's him. Mm. And I said, yeah, I said, it was great. I said, thank you very much for coming. And I said, I'm very honoured to be here. And she goes, I'm very honoured to meet you too. And walked to the next person. I just thought that was lovely. Like, she's not my queen. Mm. You know, if you want to go to religious things, the queen, air queen is in heaven. Mm. But she was a lovely woman. And she was trying to reach across the water to her nearest neighbour to say, Mm. I'm sorry Mm -hmm. for what happened. And yet, you know, she wasn't to blame for what happened. Mm. You know, so, look. You have some life, Mary, haven't you had? Well, from 50 years of age, Mm. I have met so many stars. I've met the queen. I've, you know, I've, I've travelled so much. I've I've sang on big. I've sang in the O2 in England. I've sang, I, I, you know, it's been it's been a whirlwind mm. of a career. It hasn't been. I'm not an A lister, but I don't want to be that. I'm a star in the people's hearts, mm. and I love that because I am them. Mm. I'm no different to any of them. I just took a chance with a gift I was given. And it paid off. Thank God it paid off. No, wait till I was 50 for it to pay off. But I just hadn't got the courage when I was younger. I never. I mean, I used to go, in, go in to my local pub, the Lawns. It was called the Lawns. It's Tim Young's now in Valley Ferma. And I'd get up and I'd sing a song. And I won more talent comp- competitions. But before I'd get up, I was sick. I was sick to the stomach. I was shaking. I couldn't. People were talking to me. I couldn't even hear what they were saying. I was that stressed. Where did that come from? I don't know. I Well, I, I, I suppose it comes from, you go back to my childhood. Um, a lot of it, my mom liked to drink. Now, she was never falling all over the place, but mm. she liked to drink. And she was a very lonely woman inside as well. So that came from her childhood. And if you go back to my era, to my mother's era, it, they, drink was a huge part of their societies. My mother, my grandmother sold on a, a stall. You know, and after the stall, they went for a glass of stew. Mm. And then the pub shut at 10 o'clock at night. They went back to someone's house. And my mother grew up in that. And I grew up in that. Because when I was young, the pub shut at 10 o'clock still. Mm. So there was always parties. Now, they weren't, I wasn't sitting there sad at the parties. I was sitting there having a great time. Mm. But I didn't realise that all that, that atmosphere and, and my mother getting more stronger on the drink was affecting me emotionally. Now, it wasn't that she didn't love me. And my brother was a chronic alcoholic. Uh, he's a sober alcoholic now. 24 years. The day I had to put Deborah in his arms, he stopped drinking. Did he? Yeah. I mean, he just said, I can't do this for a young baby in the house. And he started going to AA. And he praises AA to this day. And I praise them too. Because all he's gone through in the last 34 years, he should have well, well went back on the drink. He's never touched one drop or had a relapse since that day. But that all came from what we lived in. Mm. We weren't ill-treated. We were well-fed. We were kept clean. But were we encouraged did my mother emotionally, was she emotionally able to, when she didn't have the emotion for herself? Mm-hmm. She wasn't a bad person. And I don't blame her now. I, I now start my life. I, I had to kind of say, well, look, yes, it started there. My mother carried her on to horse, which was us. I can't carry that on again because it's just like a vicious circle. Mm-hmm. So I try. And even now, if I have a glass of wine, Deborah nearly has a canary because she just, she's frightened. She's frightened that, you know, I'll go down the same road. I said to her, I'm 62 now. My mother went down that when she was in her 20s. For God's sake, give me a break. Mm. You know, I'm, I'm aware of it constantly, which is a pain in the butt when you're out having a great night and you say, oh, mm. I better not cut too far with this now. And I'm always watching that elastic band. My brother calls it an elastic band. That it just takes one trip and that band is broken and you're on the other side. So I can't go down that road. Back in lockdown there, I had the last... Not, not in October, going back to the second lockdown that started after last, not last Christmas, Christmas before. I, I hit the drink like there was no tomorrow. I was sitting in the house, I had nothing else to do. The weight went back on. I was lonely. I felt there's no work coming in. What's going to happen? I was getting the pup money 
which was, what, 250? Mm. I, I was living up my savings. Things were going downhill. I panicked. Like most people, I panicked. And I actually thought I was going around the twist. So, but I remember having to stop. I remember one night saying, you can't keep doing this. This is ridiculous. You are going down the same path that, all, that your family went down and you promised yourself you wouldn't do it. And then for some strange reason, Ray Darcy asked me to go on to do some, something on his. And I said, yeah, I'd go. And when I got in there, I never spoke about what he asked me to go in. I just automatically, it was like therapy. I opened up to Ray Darcy. And the, the, the guy was crying. I love Ray. Ray is one of the nicest guys about me. And I could see the tears in his eyes because he felt sorry for me. And more or less saying, God, all the fighting you're doing and lockdown turns you to this. Mm. You know, but since then, I mean, I've got myself together. I'm, I see a counsellor. I, I, I talk. I have me, me moments of whinging. But I think I've become a lot stronger be, since the lockdown shit. Excuse the language. Mm. On, on thing. I've become a lot stronger in me. And then other things happened as well that opened my eyes. And I sit back now at night time and I go, hang on a second here. You're worth more than this. You're not, no, you, you don't deserve to be, you know, made feel any different to anybody else. And I believe that every day. And I have to wake up every day and do that. Who is making you feel like that? Just certain things in life and certain people try it, you know. Maybe they were having bad times in their lives. I don't know. But I will not let anybody bring me down again, ever, as long as I live. I am worth the person I am. And I'm a good person. And I've got a lot to give. And, you know, if you don't want to be with me, walk away. Just don't make me feel like crap. Isn't it mad that, like, I, I, and I always say this when I do conversations, things like that come up. Like, we, some people, like, say, just walk away. Yeah. Walk away from me. Yeah. Just go. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I should have done the walking away as well, but I was too afraid and too attached and too hurt and all that kind of thing. And the casting is, you know, I still care. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think, I think I'm stronger than, if I'd have walked away, I think, I don't think I'd have felt as strong as I feel now. Mm-hmm. Because I would have walked away and hid my head. Mm-hmm. And I didn't want to do that. I wanted to stand, stand tall and say, you know, whatever happens, look at me now. Look at where I am. And who I'm becoming. Mm. I'm now becoming. It's gas. I'm 62. And I'm only becoming the person I should have been many years. I always was that person. Mm. And I knew I had strength in me. Mm. But it, it just takes. Whether it takes years. Or a certain time in your life. You to realise. You, you I look at other people. And they're saying. Oh, he, t- he, did, he said this to me. And, and I feel like that. And I'm going. You're worth 20 of those people. That are saying these things. Do not let that drag you down. Stand up in your own head even Mm. and tell yourself each morning, thanks to whoever's out in the universe for getting me up this morning. Today is a good day and if it's a bad day, I'll sit for a few minutes and then I'll go for a walk. Mm. And that's, it's just little things. See, but you've endured, you've endured. Yeah. And you've, and that's where your strength comes from, your endurance. Yeah, I suppose so. And I, I I think my mother... Lord of mercy on her. She used to always, why she always, when she was sick, I'd get dragged out of work. Nobody else in the house. She'd say to me, Daddy, wouldn't get, get married, get married, get married. I was our youngest. Um, I was very open, you see. The rest of my family, I would talk about periods. I mean, going back to when I was 18 and 19, you didn't do that. No. I mean, you're going back into the, the, the 70s, mm. 79, mm-hmm. you know, actually, yeah, 79, 18, 78. Um, <clears throat> but I would. I would say to my mom, have me period, and she'd be like, the boys. And I'd say, oh, for God's sake. And I, you know, or I'd, you know, I'd talk to her mm-hmm. about the change because she'd be sitting in the thing and she'd be sweating. And I'd say, what's wrong with you? Ah, mm-hmm. thing women go through. And then I found out that it was the change of life. And mm-hmm. But she wouldn't talk to anybody. And my sister was the exact same, God love her. She wouldn't, but I used to talk, and I used to see them get embarrassed. I used to actually see them getting very embarrassed because I was very open, very open with my father as well because when I had my periods. But the gas thing about my dad was, he'd know when I had them. Mm. And he'd bring me up a cup of tea and a hot water bottle. And my mother'd say, I'll do that then. I'd say, I'm only giving the girl. She's a pain in her stomach. He knew exactly what was what was wrong. So I, I was very open. And I think some people would say, you were probably before your time. Mm. And I was always, I was a, a rebel. I mean, I ran away from home when I was 16. 
and I went to live with a guy called Brian McCabe, got engaged, we were to be married. Three weeks before the wedding, I decided to take, we, we split, and I decided to take the, well, he said to me, take the honeymoon money and go off with your friends, I off to Spain. The morning of the wedding, I'm lying up in the bedroom, fast asleep, and dying were a hangover. Um, I heard the door, and my mother talking, and I heard this man saying, um, I'm Father Walsh, who turned out to be a paedophile, by the way, so I'm glad I didn't let him marry me. Mm. Um, Mary, what time is, you know, can I speak to Mary about the wedding today? I forgot to, put, to cancel the tour. <laughs> And all the flowers now were sent to church. Oh, God. I swear to God on my mother that's in heaven. And I always remember my mother come running up the stairs to me. She was, she was very thin. And she goes, see you. Could you not have cancelled the church? That priest. Well, we all thought he was a great priest. Yeah. That priest knocking at my door. I'm mortified. I said, oh, man, I'm sorry. I have a, a dime rang over. <clears throat> and why one. did that relationship break down? Well, I met Brian when I was 16. I started in a place called CB Packaging in Clondalkin, which made all the big paper bags for cement and stuff like that. And I met him there. And I was very naive. He was my first real boyfriend. He was six years older than me. Mm-hmm. But I do remember him saying to me, you know, the day he asked me to get engaged, I was 18. And I, ha- I remember him saying to me when I said yes, um, you know, I have a funny feeling you're going to outgrow me. And I, I didn't know what that meant. Mm-hmm. I was my first boyfriend, first lover. Mm-hmm. I mean lost my virginity at the age of 17 and a half to him God. so we we won a Datsun 120 four door for 50p in the Priory in Tallaght I'll never forget it <laughs> and we sold it and we bought a house in Springfield for 6,000 oh my god isn't it crazy yeah you're, you're going back to the 70s now yeah. at this stage um and I went to live with him and I loved Brian yeah. Brian Brian was a good man he was very good to me and the whole lot but as I got older, as I reached hitting 20, I didn't, I didn't want to be living there. I loved him, mm. but I didn't love him in that way. And I don't think he did either. Mm. I think we had both outgrown each other. And he knew I was venturing on. He knew I was venturing on. So I, 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 we broke up and I, and I left. And that's when the, the lesbian relationship happened. So... Um, it's wonderful. I have a fucking great life. God bless me. Do you want to tell me a bit? I want to drink two glasses of wine. <laughs> Are we on telly? Cheers. Cheers. I know. The state of me on that. Um, the state care. of us all. Oh. But anyway. Want uh, to tell me yeah, about that. Yeah, I mean, when I was with Brian, I met a girl. I worked with a girl in CP Packaging. And we both became friends. Now, I didn't know she was gay. I just liked her as a friend. And we start going, I was engaged at the time and the whole lot. So the year, be, the, about six months before my 24th, um, I was breaking up with Brian. And she said she'd love to go to America. And I said, oh God, so would I. So we start saving. And off we went to the States. And I don't know, I can't give you a time or when. I just remember it happened. And I liked it. Did you? Yeah, I liked it at the time. I'm not, I'm not gay. Mm. I thought I was. Mm. Oh, I thought I was the biggest gay woman in the world, you know <laughs> what I mean? But she knew I wasn't. Mm. But she was what I needed mm. after coming out of a five-year relationship that wasn't bad, but she was fresh, and I had felt stale. Okay. And I don't regret it to this day. I literally do not regret meeting that woman and having that relationship. It was beautiful. It opened my horizons even more. So I can walk down the street and I can look at a woman and if she's beautiful, I'd say, oh, she is absolutely stunning. Mm. You know, but that doesn't mean, oh, she's absolutely stunning. I fancy her. <laughs> I don't. Yeah. And I say the same Just about appreciation. I, I have got the mm. appreciation that I have got inside me because of that relationship and because of the relationship with, with the, my, the Brian, I think my, my horizons opened even more. Mm-hmm. You know, so... People say, do you ever regret? No, I don't. And I Why don't, would you? I don't care if anyone slags me yeah. or anybody says that to me. I, it was the best time I started. I travelled America. I went to work on a kibbutz. And I was still partners with her on the kibbutz. And we broke up on the kibbutz mm. when I met Dave. What's kibbutz? Kibbutz is um, a community in Israel. And they, they're a community of, they call themselves the kibbutniks. They're a group of Jewish people who run these... Sometimes built on mountains and they do grapefruits. And the one I was in was called Kibbutz Geva. And I used to work in the drill factory. I used to pick the grapes. I used to work in the kitchens. Where? In Israel. What? Yeah. Back in. When, back, did, when did you go to Israel? I worked in Israel for a year. 
And then I traveled uh, Europe, I backpacked around Europe with about six of us to Turkey, to Istanbul, all that type of stuff. Did all that for two years. Yeah. After, like, <clears throat> after no I kind of left. Like, I wonder, like, you like your horizons because, like, you travelled the world. You became yeah. educated, educated, you knowledge. It, it was. I left school at twelve. Mm. Um, not great at spelling. I can mm. read, it. Mm. but my real education came from life itself. Mm. From leaving school at twelve, I'm working in Belinda's plastic knickers around the corner from me on Kylemore Road, at the age of twelve and a half, mm. and they thought I was fifteen. And my first pay pack was two pounds, two old pounds. And I remember giving my mother the money and she handed me back a 50 shilling note and that was my wages for the week. You know, so, and then, then I worked, I worked all, I worked in Richie's Milky Mints, I worked in Lee Marks, I worked, I worked in all of them, shoe factories, mm. you name it. And I was, a tr- my mother always called, said I had a gypsy in my heart. And I tell you, I hope that gypsy says there forever because I'm still travelling. I'm still broadening my horizons. And I have, I have, a, I suppose, a lot of people, I mean, I, I have loads of gay friends. Mm. I have loads of straight friends. I have loads of women friends and I have loads of male friends. So, and I can talk to each of them about different things. I suppose because I was out in the world mm. and I and I became open-minded. Yeah. And if, the, if we could all become open-minded and open our hearts at the same time, the world would be a hell of a lot better and we wouldn't have prejudice and we wouldn't have all that, that mm. crap going on. That's just who I am. Now, I don't turn around. I, I'm not saying I'm perfect and I'm great because... Listen, I'm as mad as a fucking March hair. But I do have an open mind and an open heart. And I can take criticism and sometimes it hurts. And sometimes I just say, well, you know, if I didn't take get criticism. Mm-hmm. No, so I think going out into the world opened my whole life up mm-hmm. to me. That's what I needed. Because school, I was just the laziest bitch in school. Same. The teacher used to say to me, mother, you know, why? Does she sit looking out the window? I was sitting looking, waiting for my mother to come. Mm. And it'd be about 12 o'clock. I was only going to the school. And I was sitting wait, I'm watching to make sure she'd come to the gate and pick me up. And, and yet, I was out of school, sick. I, I think I had a very bad kidney infection. I ended up in Cherry Orchard Hospital in, in Valley Fermi, which was for all that type of stuff at the mm. time. And I was in for a full week and I went back to school. And I remember walking in and the nun giving me two sheets of paper. Right, there's your test. I hadn't practiced for any of that. But I got that test. I got top marks in my test. And I left school then and I couldn't, I just stopped, I stopped learning to spell. Mm. I used to learn, I kept me reading going by reading the Bunty and all those my ca- cartoon mm. comics. That's how I kept, but the spelling just went out the window. Just went out the bloody window. But I've got through life. I've, you know. And tell me about this kibbutz. So you're on a bleeding mountain. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds mad that you're on a mountain. I wasn't on a mountain. We had a big swimming pool and all their things. There are the other ones that are built by the beach. And they would do all different fruits and stuff like that. We were in... I'm trying to remember which way it was. We were kind of in the centre. Mm. And up that way, about, say, 10 miles, there was a little town. And that way was back into Jerusalem. So we were kind of in the centre. And it was a big... It was a compound. It was, there was lovely houses in it. There was families. There was Was precious. it a cult, Mary? No. There's loads of them all over. It's, it's just... Okay. They... they I don't know if they're... The actual thing we went on was called Project 67. And you had to apply to England for it. We applied and we flew from Dublin to Luton and then Luton to Tel Aviv. And we, we met up with a man called Lustig, right? Who turned out to be very lusty. God bless him. <laughs> Not with me now, but, you know, I could see him with a few yeah. girls. Yeah. But he was married and he had a lovely family. And we used to go and look after the kids. And the kids couldn't understand. Well, the kids could speak better English than we could. Mm. But we, sometimes I was brought in to the creches just to sit with the kids and play with little blocks and stuff like that. But they only picked certain people for that. And there was only four of us in the 32 people that were volunteers on this kibbutz that were brought in that they trusted enough to bring into their homes to look after their children. So we were very honoured. And then they wanted us, they wanted to send me to music school because they heard me singing. Mm. So in other words, they, were try, they, they would adopt you. And pay a certain amount of money for you to go to school in your country. Yeah. And then you'd come back and learn Hebrew and look after their children for a year while they went to the army. That's what they used to do. Something similar to that now. I'm not sure if that's the full... Did your mother let you go? Well, I was 22. She couldn't stop me. Well, 21. She, could, she didn't stop me. I mean, back in them days, you didn't. I mean, I'm going to America and your man asked me in America, me and Deborah sitting there with her. 
backpacks on and we said, they said, what part of the state are you from? And I said, we're from Ireland. Oh, your parents are with you? And I said, no. You, you what? You, you, you two young girls are traveling around America on a Greyhound bus with your... And I said, yeah. And he says, oh my God, we don't do that here. We don't do that here. It's dangerous, dangerous. But we were very lucky. But apart from the time we came back from Vegas and got off the Greyhound bus in New York and this guy approached us and started talking real funny to us. And I'm going, what the heck? And he said, my name is something Mooney. And this is something Mooney. And I said, oh my God. And we had heard about the Moonies before we went. They were right. a cult. And they invited us to dinner, gave us their ticket. And we said, yeah, we, we, we'd meet you. We knew exactly what they were up to. We ran. We made a beeline for the first hotel, motel and stayed in that for the night, afraid of our life. We ran away home. And anyway, this was after a year traveling to America. These were trying to... And you'd see them stopping all the young people coming through with the backpacks. And this is how they used to recruit them into their, into their cults. I don't know if that still happens now. I, don't I know can imagine it does. Yeah, but it was, it was frightening because we, had, we knew. I, I, you know, as soon as they heard our accent, you say, where are you from? We said, Ireland. Oh, and they looked as if they said, oh, we've got, you know, we've got fresh food here, fresh chicken here. Because they didn't think we knew. But we had seen it on the news about all them cults and stuff like that. You know what I mean? So, yeah, it was scary. I mean, a lot of things happened when I was like, Jason, I'm not joking you. I should be dead by now. Yeah. All the stuff that I went through. Oh, I, I, I had you. a mad life. You had a mad life. I had a mad life. I, left, I ran away. As I said, I ran away from home at 16 and didn't see my mother for a year. God love her. I put them through terrible hell. But I came back and apologised. And Where were you? Uh, I walked in CB packaging. I ran away, and I went to live with Brian's family. <laughs> Where the fuck did Brian live? Tala. <laughs> <laughs> but his family were beautiful. And then you see, that's oh, when that's when I travelers. <laughs> <laughs> Fucking talent, baby boy. I ran away, didn't I? <laughs> At that time, there wasn't many buses. <laughs> <laughs> it was like the country up there. <laughs> Like, can mm. I ask you, you've mentioned him, but where was your dad with all of this? Ah, my poor dad. My dad was a very hard working man. He, he came from a very well, well-to-do family and uh, so did my mother. Well, not my mother, so did his mother. But my dad was the rock of the family. My mum was the one we all turned to for, you know, I suppose reaching out for affection. Mm. She was loving. She'd kiss us, but she did have, as I said, she, she had her own issues. My dad would not have a word said about against her. He went to work and he worked six days a week and he'd come home with his wages unopened and it was handed to my mother. And I always remember she used to put a little blue slip out at them times. You know, it was like a, a blue piece of paper mm. with all of the arrows on it. And then she'd give him the price of his points at the weekend to go for his point. That was it. He worked hard. And even during the summer on his holidays, he'd go and work in the RDS. So he, he was a hard working man. But me and my dad got on very well. And he loved country music. So I was the only one that would listen to country music with him on a Sunday afternoon, which was a uh, Treble TR, a radio station that we had here years ago. And it played American and Irish country. So I used to listen to him. And he had a transistor radio with one little ear thing. Mm. And he'd put it in and he'd say, listen to this song. And he'd put it up because my mum used to turn it off, it's crap. Mm. You know. Yeah, no, he was good. I, I got on very well with my dad. I'm, I was so close to my father that when my mother died, he clung to me. He clung to me. He went everywhere. He used to wait for me outside the shop on his walking sticks and I'd bring him for a couple of pints and then I'd bring him home to Willie and then I'd go up to my place and yeah, I miss him terrible. I really do. He died in 2004. My mum died in 1995 and he died in 2004 and we got to say goodbye to him. Did you? I got to speak to him, yeah. I was the last one to see him with his eyes open, which I'm glad because we were very close, me and him. But he was, he was a hard, he was a hard worker. I mean, I remember him going out in the snow, tick on the ground, pushing his push bike. And he always said, you know, if mammy had left me with the money, we'd be a very wealthy family. Which, he was great with money. Mm. She wasn't. Mm. She was crap with money. Crap with it. I mean, I can remember the lights being cut off. And we, at the time, we had the, the old fireplaces where you had the two rings that went in on the fire. Mm. I mean, mammy cooking dinner on that. And we'd be sitting around on, by the light of the fire and a few candles. And my dad tells tell us all haunted stories and stuff like that. But... <clears throat> So then I remember coming home from work one day and my dad meet me on the bike saying, I don't get a fright when you go around. And I said, why? What's wrong? And he said, the corporation are outside. And I said, why? What are they doing outside? So in I goes to the house and all the bags were packed. And I says, the feck's going on? And she was in arrears. But she had gone to a, a, a TD called Thomas McGillah. He was a well-known TD in, in Ballyferm at the time. And they, she, 
he had made arrangements but hadn't filtered down into the corpo. Right. Um, so they came to evict us. And next thing, Thomas McGilla drives up in a, a car and says, you at the wrong house, you at the wrong... Because everyone was out on the road watching. Yeah. And I, do you know what? I wasn't embarrassed. No. I wasn't embarrassed because I knew... I knew she was crap with money. Mm. Who I felt sorry for... I felt sorry for my mother, but I felt sorry for my dad. Because he was working all the hours God sent him. And my poor old woman couldn't... She just couldn't handle the money. Was she drinking it? No, not at that time. Mm. Not at that time. She Well, I suppose holding my Aunt Mary, her sister, would go for the shopping and end up in Hardy's. Right. And have a couple of glasses of things. She just wasn't bothered going around paying the rent. Mm. I mean, she always had a few bob. Mm. She just... I don't know. I, I, I suppose she was a little bit the drinking. Yeah, I suppose it was going to the pub of a, of an afternoon. And But she mm. always came home, made sure my daddy had his dinner. We all were fed. But And then they'd go out again that night or something like that. But it's when she started sitting in the house is when she hit the drink. She started to stop going out. Mm. And she started sitting in the house. And that's when I see my dad kind of... Kind of feel... I, I, I kind of feel she broke him at that stage. But he still wouldn't allow anybody to say anything about her. Because he... He, it was hurting him that she wouldn't go out with him anymore. She wouldn't, she wouldn't venture to the door. She became, she just wanted to stay in. She didn't want people to see her. So she'd have her whiskey beside her and her glass of stew. Wasn't Why it? did she not want people to see her? She, her insecurity, she just became, your brother's the same at the moment. He sees mm-hmm. all over the place. His paranoia is, thing, and they're very like him and her. Mm-hmm. Very like, and thank God I do have tendency to have depression, but I'm more like my father. I, I try to keep strong and I try to look at the positive side of life. Mm. Sometimes I go down, sometimes I don't. But I just believe laughter is the best medicine and my dad was like that. Mm. He'd have me in stitches of laughing. He'd laugh to himself even if he felt himself going down. Mm. And he'd see him on the bed and I'd say, why are you laughing at? Well, I don't know. You just laugh. You know, and it just... Yeah, it broke my dad when she stopped going out and she just went into herself. She just... I don't know. I, I honestly don't know because when you speak to her, she wouldn't tell you the truth. She'd tell you she was all right. Mm. You know, she wouldn't tell you. She wouldn't open up to me. And I tried. She opened up about a few, few little things to me. But the things I wanted to know, I wanted her to open up. She wouldn't. I mean, my sister wouldn't have asked her anything like that. Mm. I, I was always the one that would go over and say, look, Ma, what's wrong with you? Tell mm. me. And she'd sit and she'd cry. And then she'd look at me and she'd say, I'm grand, I'm grand, I'm grand. But I, I knew she wasn't. I mean, even my brother today now would, would say, you know, poor ma'am. Mm. She was so lost in herself. Mm. Did you ever get answers off her? No, the only answer I ever got off was she felt lonely and she didn't know why. She did not know why she felt empty and missed her mammy. And she was 60 odd and and she missed her mother. And I think what was wrong was she was, the drink wasn't helping. That's being totally honest Mm. with you. I mean, that was, it was dimming her brain. So she was living in the past. And then she didn't want me to leave her and she didn't want Willie to leave her. and, And... yeah, she just felt she just felt lonely, and I don't know why that was there, but it obviously had something to do with her childhood. Mm. And because when she'd say she felt lonely, she'd say I miss me mummy, mm. and I'd say, but ma, your mummy's dead over forty. Yeah, yeah, but I just have an emptiness inside me I can't fill. So that's basically what she was going through, and, and that's and true to so many people. Yeah, maybe. Yeah, I had a girl here two weeks ago, Orla, and. She lost her brother to suicide, and her mom and her dad within ten months she lost God a trade of bless us. And she, like she said, her mom died the day the brother died. The yeah, day her brother Stuart yeah. died, and she is like, I just want me mummy. Yeah, and she's yeah. the same age as me, at forty. Like, and she was like, I just want. And Orla will always just want her mummy. Yeah, but the funny thing is, I mean, my mom died in nineteen ninety five, and when I feel unwell. I still want me mummy, mm. but I still want me daddy too because mm. I had two of them mm. who I was close to. I don't think you ever, ever, as as a child, mm. you know, and people say, oh, now I'm sweating to death here, by the way. That's why I'm just rubbing myself. Do you want off. something about tissue? Do you want tissue? Not grand. <laughs> um, I don't think you ever stop being a child mm-hmm. and needing your parents. Mm. I think you always need your parents. Um, unfortunately, when they die, you become an orphan. But you just have to grow and, and get on with it. Mm. My sister, when she lost her husband, I think the day he died, she died with him. I mean, he died in 2011, the year after the X Factor. And he was so proud of me on the X Factor. And he died of lung cancer. And she just went downhill. She's now 73, 74. And
and she's in a home because her mind went yeah Jordan Jordan lockdown last year that's why I think I took an awful lot of yeah. breakdowns yeah because Jordan lockdown she she just went very funny she, what happened was we we brought her down to um British Bay and we stayed in a lovely house and we woke up one morning she was staying in the room with me and I woke up one morning and I went out to uh, our, our daughter Elaine and I said to her where's your ma she's in bed I said she's not in bed so we searched the house she was gone she was at the getting up finding the kids no shoes on her a coat over her thing and went off we searched the whole we were staying in a lovely little gated place to make a long story short we you know, we thought she was she was gone to the sea yeah. and drowned herself. But <clears throat> we started putting her out on Facebook. And Joe Duffy's thing, um, no, I'm telling you a lie. I'm telling you a lie. Uh, we started putting her out on Facebook. And the next thing, my other niece, Diana, her daughter, our eldest daughter, was at home in Tala. And she rang Elaine. And she says, why, why are you panicking over, mum? She's here. And she, she's in the house. She, what had happened, right? A young man was coming out at six o'clock in the morning to see some sort of a meteor shower and was opening the gate and Betty started walking out the gate and he says, well, where are you going, ma'am? She said, I'm going home, I'm going home to tell her. And he knew something was wrong. And he thought she was after having a domestic. Yeah. So he offered, felt sorry for her, offered to give her a lift. He drove her from Wicklow. Oh, my God. To tell her. Watched her go in, he bought her a coffee and a chocolate bar, a tea and a chocolate on the way home. Dropped her in there. He could have been a rapist. Yeah. Dropped her into the house. She said thank you and went in, locked the door. And he headed back to the thing. So we discovered Betty was fine. But we couldn't find out. Mini said, some man brought her home. So we put a search out and Joe Duffy's came on and I was talking to them. Yeah. And we found the man. He was actually in the place we were staying. And he didn't want to go on the radio. Yeah. So we bought him champagne and stuff and he came around to us and he says, I just felt sorry for her. He said, I didn't realise her mind was gone, he said. And now that you're telling me, she was talking about her husband being in the army and she was going right back. Oh, God. He said, we had a great conversation all the way home, he said, and she was wide awake. Yeah. And he said, I said, look, he said, I'm sorry for that. I said, not at all. I said, I'm glad you picked her up. Mm. I mean, you didn't know where she was staying. Mm. I'm glad you brought her home. But we knew then that... But she only went like that after Liam died. She just, her whole mind went. Were you terrified when you, when you yes. realised she wasn't there? Yes, it was dead? the most horrible feeling. And that was like, it was like losing a child. It was like your child gone missing. And me and Betty are the only two girls in the, in the whole fa- in the family. Yeah. And she's, she was me rock up, you know, she's not now, God love her, because she can't, but she does ask for me now and then. And I get to see her when I can. Um, Yeah, it was the scariest thing I ever went through in my life. And watching her kids panic. And the tears in the the grand the, her grandkids' face, thinking that nanny was gone. Oh my God. It was a horrible feeling, horrible. But we got her back up, anyway. Because yeah. when you see all these things about people missing, and then you know sometimes it's a good news story, sometimes it's a terrible news story. Jesus Christ! We were expecting the bad news story because we went out to the beach the day before, and there was a poster up on the poles. Mm. This lady who's gone missing. And the first thing Elaine said to me, oh, Mary, maybe she's going to be like that woman that went missing and never came back. They never found this woman. Oh, my so, God. And that's what went through all our heads. And it was just by someone praying for her, someone with her on that day. And that's the way I believe. I believe Liam was with her. Mm-hmm. My mother was with her. And that gentleman came along and, thinking he was doing the good thing, brought her home to Tala. Drove from Wicklow to Tala. Oh, my God. To bring her home right outside their door. And she knew exactly where she was going. How kind of him. Yeah. Because as you said, he could have been anyone. He could have just left her there. He could have brought her, but he brought her home because he just knew that she was in so much distress. She couldn't get out the gate until someone opened it. And when when he opened it, he kind of looked and he said he knew something was wrong, but he he didn't realise that she was... Because when you were on the stage with me and you said that you had that breakdown, you talked about going across to the pharmacy to the lady who saved you. Yeah. You know, and helped you that day. I did wonder, where has this come from? Like, where did this... And like I was like, it's not just, and I know, God, I know Carl Broderick was in an awful state. And as much as us in travel, lockdown was horrific for it us. Was, you know what yeah. I mean? But for you guys, yeah. when you couldn't perform. Yeah. And, and the fact that 
that was all happening as well with the sister. Mm. Um, so I think that's why that particular day that I was going to... I don't even know if I was going to do anything. Do you want to I tell just, people what happened that day? Just cause they, it, well, it was, it was a build-up to it from, from the time my sister was printed the home and the whole lot. And I was just... I was sitting there going, you know, this, this can't be happening. I had no work. Well, mm. nobody had any work. Mm. We were all locked down. There was people suffering more than me. Mm. But for me, as pers- my personal story was that I, I hit the bottle. Because I had nothing else. I mean, you get a bottle of wine for a six euro in Aldi's mm. or something like that. And it seemed to be my only friend at the time. And I, I started drinking. Then Betty, then, th- no, after I was told Betty was going into a home. So that was on my head. And then I was, I was told, we're going into another lockdown. And because I suffer with depression, I allowed it all to take its toll on me. So on this particular day, after weeks of Betty being put into the home and I'm sitting there going, my family's falling around me, there's no work, we're never going to get back. So I allowed the demons climb right in and dig the biggest hole they could dig. And this particular day, my daughter had gone jogging. I put on my coat. I said, I'm going for a walk to myself. Walk down the road. The thing that came into my head was Chapel Lizard, the river. Now, I don't know if I had in my head to jump into the river, but the river sounded calming. That's what was in my head. If I can get to the river, all this pain will stop. And I'm walking down Lafonia Road, and I got to the traffic lights, and I spotted, I looked over at the chemist, and it was like someone switched in my head. And I went, what the hell am I doing? And I walked over to the chemist. Now, remember, I was changing tablets as well at the stage. Mm. My antidepressant tablets, I was swapping mm-hmm. from one to another, which I shouldn't mm. have done. Yeah. So it was a combination of all that was going yeah. on, no work, switching mm. tablets. Over to the chemist I went, and I spotted Ramona, this beautiful girl standing up at the counter. And she said, can I help you? And I just burst into tears. And she said, oh, Mary, she realised who I was and brought me into the room, sat me down, got me tea, listened to me for a half an hour, blubbering. I had no idea what I was saying to the girl. I was blubbering. And all I kept saying was the river, the river. And she kept saying, oh, my God, Mary, hang on a second, hang on a second. So she got one of the other girls, another woman I know there, Margaret, came in and stood beside me. She went out, rang the doctor, who was only down the road. And the doctor says, bring her into me. So I went into the doctor. But as I left that girl, I remember feeling an overwhelming power of love for that person. Because if she hadn't been there, mm-hmm. would I have walked back out? Mm-hmm. I don't know, but it was her kindness as well. And her gentle, she was very gentle with me. Mm-hmm. And listened. Didn't try to give me advice. Mm-hmm. Just said, you'll be all right. We'll sort this out. We'll get you to the doctor. And that's what happened. Into the doctor. I was in there for a half an hour, crying my heart out. She said to me, oh... Get off them. And she put me back onto my own ones. And she drove me home. No, I went out and then Ramona drove me home in the car. The girl has left now. She left last week. So I sent her a big bunch of flowers and a box of chocolates. But I still see her as an angel. Mm. I see whoever was helping me as I got to that corner, turned me towards there and told me to go in that direction instead of that direction. So over I went. And she happened to be, there was loads of people in the shop, but she was the one I seen. She was the one that took me hand and brought me back into the back row. So, you know, it didn't solve all my problems, but mm. it made me realise what I was doing. I couldn't believe it. Mm. I remember sitting there on the chair about two days later going, what in the name of God were you going to do with yourself? Mm. It just, it was like, and all I kept thinking was the elastic band that Willie told me. Mm. You know, have you got over that elastic band? But I hadn't. Mm. I was just feeling the crunch, like everybody else. The first lockdown was great. We all got through it. Not a bother. Second lockdown, sister in a home, starting to drink more, no walk, no gigs. Christmas might be banned again this year. It was, for everyone, it was a horrible thing. There was people going through worse than I was going through. But for me, it was a mental torture because I suffer with depression in any way. And your medicine, changing your medicine. And changing just med- absolutely. At the time, I decided to change the medicine. Yeah. I thought I was as strong as an ox. Yeah. But it wasn't. It, it was just, you know, you... To this day, I listen to my doctor. Mm. She, I will listen to her and I will listen to my gut as well. Because my gut told me you were changing this medicine for what reason? You see the way I sweat Mm. from the back of my head. Mm. 
I kept thinking, it's the medication. It's the medication. Now, I've been thinking that for years. So I said to her, we just try a different medication. I said, I feel a lot stronger. Let's go on a lower medication, different one. It just didn't work. There was an emptiness inside me that I had not felt for over 20 years before I started taking my medication. That emptiness came back. That feeling of not belonging. Mm. Who the hell do you think you are? Imposter syndrome. Yeah. Horrible. Mm. Horrible. And dislike for the person that was in the mirror. Really? Yeah. Ugly. Who could even look at you? Now, I don't feel like that now. But I, ho- I hope no, you I don't. don't. Well, Rob Murphy had battled me to death. Yeah. And I started feeling like that. Yeah. No, no, I've become... I've become a better person because of all of that. Mm. I'm not saying that I'm cured because I still take medication. Mm. I get me low days. But when those low days come, I let myself have a certain amount of time with that lowness. Sit in it. And then I get up. I get dressed. I get washed. I look in the mirror and I say, you're worthy of anything you're getting. Get the feck out of this house. And Mm. I go for a walk across the field. Now, with the arthritis, I'm on two sticks walking across the field, but Mm. I don't care. I don't care. People know I have arthritis. Who cares? They fucking know all my life now. Well, they know what I want them to know. (laughs) (laughs) Because the thing is that, you know, in our circle, like Alan, Carl, Rob, we idolise you. But the funny thing is I idolise all of you as well. And Mm. I know that you all have my back. Mm. And a lot of people would say, how? how," Because they don't know. I know who has my back and who hasn't. Mm. And it took me. I suppose to have little breakdowns and little stuff mm. to realise who's there for me. Mm. And who, my, my friends, I've got three friends at home, four friends at home actually I should say, who are with me since all our kids were born. And we go back, way back, and through the X Factor and the pops coming over to Ireland, asking silly questions, trying to find out who Deborah's father was. My friend stood by me, I said, get as much as you can, mm. because they were coming and paying money. <laughs> And I said, and tell them, fuck all then. Just mm. give them what you think. Mm. And I mean, they, they, they were making thousands. And I was going mm. these little books. But they stood by me. Mm. They, they kept it. And the new group of friends now that I have, mm. yourself included, mm. I know you have me back. Mm. And I know that we're not bosom buddies. Mm. But I also know there are certain things I could trust you with. Mm. And that means a lot. Mm. That means a lot. I mean, Alan Yeo is, oh, he's a maggot in his head at times. He really mm. is. But he's kept me in the in the the light. He's you know he's helped me out in work and stuff like that. Mm. And Rob, oh, mm. what can I say about mm. Rob? You know mm. those people who know him as Buffy. Yeah, you know I swear on my fur. <laughs> he he's just a good man, and and mm. I know he's always there for me. I remember when this was actually happening in present. He um sent me a huge bunch of flowers, mm. and I opened the door and and I said to the girl. Who's that? For? I don't know. I've just asked to bring them down to you, Mary. So I brought them in. I opened it up, and it was from Rob because mm-hmm. we had to listen to the thing on the radio. Mm-hmm. And I just I was so touched. It was just a bunch of players. I mean, I didn't even expect anyone to do that, but he was there for me. Mm-hmm. So I know Rob will always have me back, and Rob's a good guy, mm-hmm. you know. And you know, is it all good people? I mean, we we're away for them three days. We had a great time. A bunch of people who probably never mm-hmm. had ever been together in that close. Mm. And, and there we were as if we'd known each other for years mm. so that's a good sign of the characters you know we I'm have laughing at? What? <laughs> can I tell people the story you can tell them whatever you want I haven't shrubbed talking so oh, good time you start no. talking uh, I was sit- we're, so we're in Belfast and anyone who knows <laughs> you know where I'm going now yeah. <laughs> in Belfast and we Anyone who knows cruising, you arrive in a port at a certain time and you get back on board for a certain time. And me being the long time cruiser that I am, I always take a photo of That's the it. back on board sign. Yeah. So we're sitting there at a drinks reception. The ship is leaving in 45 minutes. And I just said, where's Mary Bourne? And Rob said to me, you should be a while because we're leaving at nine. And I said, <laughs> no, we're leaving at half fucking seven. <laughs> So I said, sent a text message, no response. I said, you know what, I'll have to ring. And I rang Sandra's phone, or did I ring your phone? You rang Sandra. And you answered it. Sand- no, Sandra said, me too. That's a record. <laughs> and I went, oh, where we were are just you? leaving. They were finishing their wine at that stage. Mary, where are you? <laughs> <laughs> I 
It was the panic in your voice that made us laugh. And I was sitting there like that at the boom, boom, boom of the music. And I said, she's in a fucking pub. She <laughs> is in a pub. <laughs> So I says, I says, yeah, okay, I'm, I'm finished. We're on the way, we're on the way, we're on the way. I says, Mary, not nine o'clock, Mary, half seven. We're leaving. This is like quarter, 20 to seven. Mary, how long will you be? 15 minutes. Now, do you know what? The latest, 10 past seven. <laughs> I was like, Mary, I need you here at seven. Well, Ron kept your, kept your, your, oh kept my. your back. Oh, here we was. Do you want me to go back? Do you want me to go back? So I went over to the, to the team and I said, we have a situation. <laughs> <laughs> and they said, what's wrong? I said, Mary Bourne's in a pub in the middle of Belfast and this ship is leaving in 40 minutes. (laughs) So the girl, Isla, lovely, and Mark, you know, Mark says, ah, we grab, we grab, we sort of, and Isla, I just looked at Isla and I said, no, just be honest with me. And she says, it's up to Captain. Captain will decide if we leave Mary behind (laughs) or if we'll wait on Mary. And I was like, okay, okay, okay. And I went back and Rob Morphy said to me, good news story if Mary Bourne misses the boat. (laughs) They were waiting on me oh to my on. god here i was oh my god oh my god oh my god oh my god and my legs were going and my legs and paul was saying to me you'd be grand you'd be grand and then mark came over and he said have you got an eta and i was i don't have an eta and i was like mary have we got an eta <laughs> and then he went and had a smoke paul kelly and he came back and he goes she's here she's here she's getting over taxi she's getting this as the bleeding ropes are being pulled up and the ship is be- is pulling away That's and i true. was like mary born and rob Murphy has that video yeah yeah, yeah. I'm coming up the, the, the gangplank and I'm giving out mortar. I wouldn't have missed them. Why would I? We're after having about five glasses of wine. Why would I have? Ah, no, I, this is ridiculous. And next of all, I heard, this is a man's world. I look up, there's Rob. I say, fuck off, you. Yeah. <laughs> well, me oh. nerves are gone until I got <clears throat> that text message from, of that phone call from Paul. She's here, she's here, she's here. Yeah. I was like, thank God. I was like, how am I going to explain that yeah. Mary born? Would have been great publicity for Mary Bourne. It would have been great. And then I was saying, because Isla was saying, will she travel to the next port? And I said, no, she'll go an hour and a half home to Dublin and she'll be grand. Like, do you know what I mean? I was like, how am I going to do this? But we had a ball. We had a ball. When we came back, Rob said to me, he said, you know what? He said, the drama. He said, the day was quiet. He said, you know, it was kind of a dull day because it's just a day on the ship. But he said, Mary, the drama when you didn't turn up. He said, poor Rebecca. (laughs) And I said, where is she? He said, she's gone to bed. And I said, why? He said, I said, I said, oh, Sandra, poor Rebecca is fucking not well because I'm fucking not here. And he said, here he was to me, I've never seen you so stressed in your life, babe. Yeah. I was like, yeah, because, babe, if she misses this flight, <laughs> uh, this ship, I was like, do you understand the repercussions? She's missing the ship. I got to have to send security to our cabin to pack our bags <laughs> and get our bags off in Glasgow. I was like, seriously, I was like, it's going to be all over. All the newspapers we get in, we'll ring Alan Hughes, get him to get on Ireland AM. Wouldn't it be funny, though? No, it no, wouldn't I wouldn't. Be I, I wouldn't. <laughs> but you see, the thing was, while we were in the pub and you had rang us, we were just finishing off the, the wine. And I, Sandra was actually sitting there now with Sandra. Yeah. I said, Sandra, we have to go because I said, we'd be back on the ship by seven. She said, I know, yeah. I said, it's 10 to seven. Now, Sandra. <laughs> so she said, oh, right. So there was me and a group of fellas that we, we met when we were on a cruise last October. Yeah. And we were sitting there, a bunch of Northern Ireland fellas, yeah. and we're having a great crack with them. And I had to keep watching the thing because Sandra was in conversation to beat the band. Yeah. So I said to Barra, Barra was, he's, he's a weatherman from, on BBC in Northern Stop. Ireland. Can you ring a taxi? So he rang the taxi and she's still yapping. I said, I'm going to go outside and take this. No taxi. So we had to leave the pub, walk down a road and here, and now Barra panicked more than nothing else. Here he was, oh, sacred hearted Jesus, not going to get you into a taxi. And I said, stop worrying, we get there, we get there. So we just nagged a, a taxi off the road and your man was brilliant and he's pissing himself laughing. I said, me poor woman that runs it. I said, Rebecca, she's up to her eyeballs and here he is. Ah, God, no. Ah, he's a bad bitch and he, he booted around the place but he got us there at 10 past. Because oh, then what happened was Isha, um, Isha she, was, she was two hours waiting on a taxi and she said to me, what's wrong? And I said, because um, she could see it. And I said, Mary Bones, Mary Bones in Belfast and so poor, but I can't get around the ship. I don't know what I'm going to do. And she said, uh, oh, we were two hours waiting on taxi. And here was Rob. Oh, no. Rob Murphy, did you hear that? Two, two hours. <laughs> she was wagon. two hours waiting on a taxi. Oh, Rebecca, two He's hours. Here I was. Oh, Rob, please stop. Will you stop? And he like, was making you worse. He was making me worse. Yeah. So no wonder I went to bed sick <laughs> with my stomach. But I text, I was, we only woke up. I we went in and went fast asleep. 20 past 12 we woke up at 
And I looked at Sam and I said, I won't be able to go back to sleep. We need to go get a drink. And the bar was shut. We went down. So I'm texting you, where are you, Rebecca? <laughs> Trying to run. And then was, we met Rob. Uh-huh. And he said, you were fast asleep. And I said, oh, God, I'm about to be ringing that girl and everything. She'll fucking kill me tomorrow. No, that was grand. I was just like, get her on board. So we did. And you'd sang. And like, as Shane put up today, I just said earlier on, Shane put up today about the chills. And what I love about you, and I'm not throwing flowers at you. Uh, well, I am. But, you know, I love watching the reaction of people. Yeah, yeah. When you... A lot of people say that. Open your mouth. I love it. It was Mark's expression that caught me on that. Because yeah. he was the only one I could see in my eye line. And mm. when I started Man's World, mm. and the mic came down here, and I just see Mark going, wow. Yeah. And I was about to laugh. I said, you're singing the song, don't laugh. Yeah. But he came over to me and I said, Jesus. Yeah. I said, I tried to change that song so many times to sing it the way it should be sang, which, yeah. is, which is the original way, but I cannot do it. Because it's how I was taught to mm. sing it. And it is a big song. And Rob was sitting there going, Yeah. And they were all just sitting was. there. It was just it was And I was saying to them all, No, me burns on, me burns on, <laughs> me burns. I was like, No, you come up and they were saying, Can we can we move up a little bit? And I was like, Yeah, of course it can move up. And then I was saying to the English guys, um, and uh, the Scottish girl, I I was like, Have you ever heard her sing? And they were like, No, and I was like, wait till she sings. <laughs> and then I'm doing me little hands and all I, I like, know, I was watching. Oh, you. I just absolutely adore it. you've just got this talent thank you a god-given much. talent yeah it's a gift from a gift I, I i hid under a bush for years out of, out of pure insecurity you know mm. and and, and self-doubt I mean, we all have it but i just took it to a different level that's never going to happen again i mean i'm acting now i'm fucking tell me about that oh well i think everybody has seen it i've been all over the television myself and jake carter and uh linda mccarty and Nicole Bannum are going to be doing Dirty Dustin. Okay. We'd done it before lockdown twice and we got standing ovations everywhere we went. Now, when I read the play, I didn't find it funny <laughs> because it was English. Right. So when the producer took it and put in the Irish stuff, okay. it made it more funnier. And on the day I was walking out, the first day I walked out, my legs... I'm carrying a Hoover and Joe Dolan is singing, such a good looking woman. And we're walking out and my legs are like that. And I looked over at Linda and she's the same. But we put the thing, the, the crowd started clapping immediately. I put the, the thing down, the voices, we started talking, forgot half of our words, went, skipped about that much of the, the dialogue, but went on to the next one. So it went down so well that we tried to do it in lockdown and it didn't work. Mm. So we now have it going and Jake is with us this time. And it's going around the, the country. Uh, we started off with two nights in this one night in Pacific, which ended up two nights and now three nights. And the first two nights are sold out, and the second is selling like mad. Oh we're, I, we're everywhere, we're Mullingar, we're, we're all over the place. We're six weeks traveling around the country, and it is selling like wildfire. And the, th- the thing about the play is, it's about three elderly ladies and one young man. The three elderly ladies are cleaners that work in this office block every weekend. And the, the, the fella, who is Jake, Dave, he is kind of like an arrogant little <laughs> Billix. <laughs> That's the only way I can put him. Mm. And he can't bear the fact that these three ladies, he, he says they did the smell of piss off them and everything. <gasps> oh, he gets his comeuppance. Mm. That's as far as I go. But we go in one weekend and we're told we're going to be let go because we're over 65. So we decide to get our revenge yeah. and we start a sex line. <laughs> and the sex line, people will say, a sex line, oh my God, it's going to be filthy. It's the innuendos. It's old mm. slapstick. Mm. And those, you know, we say something. We don't actually say the words, but the people know. Mm. And the laughter. And it's just, it's from the, the time we open our mouths to the time we finish, it's funny. It's funny for them. Mm. We're standing there trying to remember our lines, but mm. <laughs> it's mm. the point. Mm. But it's a great old play. And it was written by English writers. Um, and that we took it, well, we, I didn't take it. The producer took it and wrote it to suit the, the Irish mm. market. And it's going down well now. It's still travelling England. It's still doing doing the UK. Mm. So we do it around Ireland, which we didn't think it'd work in Ireland. Mm. But by God, we were wrong. And now that lockdown is over, people are crying out for a mm. bit of laugh. Now, there's so much happening, as you know yourself. I mean, the, the market was saturated with all the yeah the government grants and people were doing this show and that show. There was too many. People didn't know what to go to. But thanks be to God... At the time we're doing it, which is starts, I think, the 19th of October, not too sure, and it finishes the 2nd or 3rd of December. People are actually going for this because they've done all the music bits. 
Now they want to see mm. Mary Bourne make a eejit of herself on stage <laughs> and Jake Carter get his uppance. And that's what's going to happen. And I'm really looking forward to it. The mm. only problem is, like, I know all the, the dialogue, but I'm trying, I just cannot seem to get my head around the book again. I know the beginning of it off by heart, mm. the middle I'm a bit shaky and the end I haven't got a clue. So I start rehearsals on Monday. Oh my God. And I have to be off my book. I don't think I'll be off the book, mm. but... Listen, I'll have it there just to throw back on. But by, by, by the end of the first week, mm. because we will have done it so many times, yeah. all of it will come back to yeah. us. And now I'm actually feeling Elsie. I'm Elsie in it. Right. I'm beginning to realise who Elsie is. It took me two shows to this show to realise that Elsie is a feisty woman with a heart of jelly. God. That's who she is. But mm. she's a character. And of course she slept around and she's had her days. and <laughs> But she's all melt as well, you know. Right. So no, it's great. It's going to be great. And then I've got the Panto in Longford, which starts, I think, the 19th of December. Right, I go straight from the play, I go into rehearsals oh, for the Panto. Do we're, we're in the Panto up until... What show is it? It's called Billy and the Beanstalk. Okay. And it's um, it's in Longford. It's Jerry, who used to work with Alan Carroll yes. backstage. Mm. He, used to be the, he was the stage manager. Mm. He, it's, he's a partner in it now, and he puts... Like we go, it's in a big school hall in Longford, right? And you think a school hall, yeah. But whatever they do to that stage and the sound system we have and the lighting, it just—it's so professional. It's incredible. The only problem I have is they have four steps up to the stage, and I've heard right is, yeah. and I have to go up there with a big bloody dress on me oh and God. be a fairy again. I'm sick of being a fairy. <laughs> I That's said right. to Jerry, if you do not put me in a something evil the year after next, yeah. I am not coming back. Yeah. He oh. said, you can't be evil because you're merely born. I said, the people want to see the quality of acting. Oh, I I'd do. love that. <laughs> oh, I'd love to be the wicked yeah. queen or something. Yeah. And just let me oh, out <laughs> and sing all the evil songs. That's what I'd like to do. So Mary, what does, I know what it's like, but what does the future hold for you and how are you today? Well, first of all, today I am in a much better place than I was Um I have me battles, but I don't let the demons mm. in anymore. Well, look, they're always there, mm. but I can't live with them. So I have to keep throwing them out every so often. They're evicted every morning, mm. evicted every morning. But I still battle, but I'm in a hell of a lot better. And I actually now believe in me. Mm. And it's taken a long time for that to happen. Mm. So when you start to believe in you, you start to like you, and then you start to love you. And you can't love anybody else unless you can love you. Mm. I've learned that. I've heard people say it. I never knew what they meant mm -hmm. until now. So I like who I am. I'm a good person. And I would not hurt a fly. And I'm going to carry on being that person. Yes, I'll have me ups and downs. And I'll have me little breaks. But I will not let the, de the demons live with me forever. I mm -hmm. They live with me forever, but I can't let them, you know, lodge there. Yeah. They, have, yeah. they can stay around. I don't care where they are, mm. as long as they're not in there. Mm. So that's where I am at the moment. I'm, I'm in a much stronger place than I ever was. And for the future, there's lots of things happening. There's lots of stuff coming up. I'm doing a country album. I have a friend of mine who is going to put the money up for me to do this album. And I'm going to do my heart and soul into this. I'm going to write a song for it. I've got two other people who are going to write a song for it as well. Um, and I'm going to do some of the old songs for my dad. Oh, wow. So that's that. And then there's other little things in the pipeline that I can't really talk about because mm. they're big. And if they don't happen, I don't want people disappointed. Yeah. yeah. But they are big. Yeah. And it's something I've wanted to do for a long time. I don't know if I'll be allowed to do it. I don't know mm. if I'll be accepted. But it is in, it's in the pipeline. So excited for you. So life, life is good. And mm. as I said, we're all in, a, 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 at the moment, we're in the middle of disaster with everything going mm. up. And, you know, the government given, I, I, I laugh at the government. Sorry for just, I just need mm. to get this out. I laugh at the government at times. Like they, they, they're trying their best, but the amount of money that they get paid they just don't get mm. where we're coming from mm. because they're living in a much higher place than we are. Yeah. So they don't get. But, you know, I hate to say they're trying their best. They could do a lot more. Mm -hmm. That's the way I feel about the government. And I feel sorry for anybody out there. But what I want to say to people out there is this. Yes, we're going through a horrible time. And anybody who has demons, talk to somebody. Mm. Get help. And even with your problems, with your bills and stuff, don't be afraid and don't be ashamed mm. to say, I'm struggling. Mm. Because there's help out there as best as you can do. Now, I just have to say that because no, people don't understand mm. that everybody is going through this. Mm. And we all have pride, but pride comes before a fall. 
And if you are having huge problems in your home or your bills, your family's going to suffer if you don't swallow your pride and get help. Agreed. They shouldn't have to. Mm. The government should be doing all this for them. I'm grateful for what the government has given us at the moment, but we're going to need a hell of a lot more as, as the years come on. Mm. So that's Can I ask you before I let you go, what yeah. is or what has been your favourite song to sing? Right. There are loads of songs. I mean, I Who Have Nothing, obviously, is one of the songs. And that brings me back to Deborah's father as well. You know, uh, I suppose the love I had for him. I loved him more than he ever loved me. He wasn't a bad person. Mm -hmm. Um, That's one of them. The other song is when I first seen him with the girl he was with. It's uh, it's, You Don't Have to Say You Love Me. And I remember, you know, I was pregnant with Deborah, and he walked into my local bar with this, this girl. And I never said anything. I sat there just that hurt inside me. And I was, I think, three or four months pregnant. And they caught me up to sing. And the first song that came into my head was, When I said I needed you. And I sang the song. And I cried. He just stood at the bar. with, And my friend, Julie Lord of Mercy, who's dead now, she was sobbing. And that song has stuck with me ever since. So every time I sing that song, it gives me goosebumps. Oh, my God. And it just... It just means so much to me. So that's one of the favourite songs. I have loads of favourites, but that one. That and I Mary, it's like a fuck. It's like a movie. It's like a movie. Rob Murphy, get your feckin' pen out. I know. Because this is what we're trying to do as well, myself yeah. and Rob. So that's yeah. something in the pipeline too. It's like to write a, a To write a play, or not to write a play, I suppose to write my life story, story. to music. Yeah. And I will tell the story and the music will be played. And oh, I will do it. God. I will act that music out. I will cry my heart out. Because while I'm talking to people and telling them the story, and then I have to sing the song, it's going to be very emotional. So there'll be a lot of people crying that night, but then they'll all go get drunk. Yeah! Mm-hmm. Oh. And on that note, we leave it there, Mary Bourne. Mm-hmm. Thank you so much. It's been an absolute pleasure. For coming into my life. Like, I don't, again, I don't know how, and then, like, me 40, I didn't, you know, that was the big thing, and, like, the big... and. When Alan said I have a surprise for you and you walked around the corner, like I could have passed out peacefully, like I really could have. And like you just you just light up every room you go into. Thank you. And as I said, yeah, pure joy, pure heart. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. And I just have to say you are the same. You light up every room you're Stop. into. Thanks. You're very good. Love Thanks, you lots. Mary. Love you too.